Hello again, everyone. Welcome back to this next edition or the next episode of the Tiger Avon Rescue Budget Hill Climb Blaster build. We'll have to work on the title. It could be a bit shorter. Um, what we're going to do this time, as I mentioned last time in the little update, is we're going to go in more depth on the dash, why we did it, how we did it, how I made the aero screen, because this one, I've had quite a few requests on that, how we did it. Um, and just to explain generally why, and we'll concentrate just on the dash area for this episode. I'll be doing other things. I've got a lot of the wiring in now. Main battery cables are in, engine bay wiring's done. But let's just concentrate on this area. We'll do, we'll just do a how-to this time as well on the metal forming on the wind deflector so you can see more of what's going on rather than just subsequent updates. I'll take it all apart and then we'll talk through the, the whys and the how-tos. Yeah, and you can see what short work Matt made of it. And that's a bit of an old Allen key with the end cut off, just so that you can undo them all rather than twiddling an Allen key all the time. There we go. Then we'll start taking the rest of it apart. Right, now to get access to the rest of this, I'm just going to pop the steering wheel off because it makes it easier to get to everything. And then you'll see it's all made in separate panels. One for the battery isolator, one for the secondary instruments, one for the main instruments. This was all about the thought for motorsport. If something goes wrong, you need to get easy access in here and be able to take stuff apart in the pits without having to crawl upside down and try and get your head up underneath here. So this is all very much considered and why we did it in three separate panels. So there's speedo rev counter and warning lights. And there's ancillary gauges. Now I know there's no wiring on it at the moment, but you can see there's a multi-plug on some of these. And what I'm going to do is put the whole panel on its own multi-plug. So if I want to take it apart, undo the screws, pull it forwards, undo the multi-plug, I can get to everything easily and quickly. Right, so this one's just got the indicator switch in it. And you can see how they're all made. It's just flat aluminium pieces with some carbon fiber self-adhesive wrap. And when you try and tuck it over the edges, get yourself a hot air gun or a paint stripper gun and warm it before you pull it over. And then what that does is it softens the plastic and it allows all these corners to be how you can mold them into shape with your thumb then as it's going round. If you don't do that, what tends to happen is it'll be on there for half a day and it starts to peel back up again because the plastic is trying to return to its original shape. So use a hot air gun, warm it, and then push it over. So that's the indicator switch. Now hopefully I can reach over just far enough to get this one out. That's not gonna come right out because it's got the battery cables attached to the back of it now. But you can still see the principle that I can get it to there and I can reach anything and I need to. Okay, for the next bit, this is the main former for the top of the dash. Uh, it's actually a piece of 15 mil thick alley which came out of a, a skip, which gave me a, a nice big chunk to be able to use. But it's held on, whereas I've drilled and tapped the top to be able to hold the aero screen onto it, I've drilled and tapped the bottom and put some studs into the bottom of it so it's nice and strong and rigid and it's held on. One. Two, and you can also see there's a nice big spreader washer on the back so it doesn't put too much point loading on the fiberglass. And that's how it lifts off. Now, if you saw the last video, you'll see me making another one of these as the little infill piece, because this is set back 
from the main dash face. We needed to bridge that little gap, and that's what this piece was for. And if you look underneath here, you can see it's held on with just a couple of little dome headed bolts. I've got the shift light coming through it. This is the adjuster for the shift light cut in point and the light itself. And you can see around the back, I've had to modify the housing for the shift light to clear the aero screen because it was pointing too far outwards. Right, so now we've got all this off, you can see how much of the dash I've actually had to cut away to make this work. Because it's not structural, it still needed to be reasonably stiff, even though it's not structural. So what I've done is I've got a bit of inch by inch aluminium right angle, and I've riveted it, you can see part of it here, underneath the lower edge of the dash all the way across, and it comes right up into the corners here. This has put the strength back in the middle of the dash so that it doesn't end up all floppy. And when all the panels are screwed onto it and the aero screen screwed onto it, everything gets nice and stiff and it all stays still. Okay, so now, now we've got the bits off the car, we're gonna have a slightly closer look at what's what, where I can show you how it's all been made. Now let's start with the main former for the top of the dash. If we look round the back and underneath, you can see it's one great big chunk of aluminium. I'm very fortunate that I've got a big 24 inch throat bandsaw with a metal cutting blade in it. So this was all cut out on the bandsaw and then the profile on the top, is as this sits on the car, the aero screen goes back at an angle. So this had to be then angled with a flat wheel on an angle grinder to get it the right shape. You can see there's quite a lot of work in here as well. This was quite fun because I can't get the bandsaw in normally. So if you look just here, there's a little tiny split. So I cheated like hell, cut in with the bandsaw to make all the inside of this disappear. And then when this little bottom plate goes back on again, because it's got a bolt either side, that keeps that nice and rigid and still. Because it's 15 mil thick alley, it's thick enough to drill and tap really comfortably. So your bolts go into it easily there. And these are the studs drilled and tapped into the bottom to hold it onto the top of the scuttle. It's the same carbon fibre wrap, and again warmed up as it come around the corner to make sure it stays put. So that's the main former. Now let's have a look at the other gauges. The main gauge is nothing fancy, it's just a piece of flat aluminium. But if we actually have a look at the clocks, these came out of a Triumph Dolomite, and they didn't used to look like this. They had white needles, and there was no colour in any of these bits. So I got onto eBay, found some sticky back plastic and a scalpel. Took the, the bezels off the front and took the glasses out because I wanted to clean them anyway because they looked a bit old and grotty. Put a bit of sticky back plastic on the needles, some coloured sticky back plastic in here. Repainted the bezels in satin black rather than the grotty chrome they were originally, just to try and make them look more interesting. Because of the budget, I bought the whole dashboard for 50 quid for all the dials and everything I needed. If I'd bought that as individual new instruments, every single one would have been 50 pounds for per gauge. So you can see the difference it made. With a little bit of effort in the evening with a scalpel and a sticky back plastic. I've done the same here on these ones. I've covered over the Smith's logo with a little tiny instrument logo or a function logo so you can see which one's which. And I've put some little coloured segments on the gauge and made the needles red. I've got a total investment in all the modifications in this, probably £1.50, and to make them look different. Again, it's a sheet of ordinary flat aluminium with the carbon fibre wrap over the top. But what I will show, my son made these little bezels to angle the instruments. If I show you there, you can see how much of an angle is on them, to angle them towards the driver so they work better. And we started with a prototype in fluorescent green, lovely. And all they are, he, he actually is a very good CAD designer, drew them up, and he's got a small scale 3D printer. And these are printed in ordinary PLA, just as an example. We were gonna try and do them in nylon to make them stronger. But as you realize, when the instrument's in here, it slides in and sits on this little recess. And when it's pulled in round the back with this clamp, there's no load on that at all, it's not going anywhere. So PLA was absolutely fine for it. Even though it's reasonably fragile, it worked fine for here. If you were gonna do these for an IVA test, it wouldn't be rocket science to introduce the correct radius on that corner as well. So you could take non-compliant gauges and turn them into compliant gauges 
with a little surround. Angled or not, you just need somebody who's got a little 3D printer and the enthusiasm to have a go. The switches along the bottom here. I bought one of these aftermarket Chinese race car switch panels because the switches, to buy it as a complete unit, was cheaper than I could buy the switches individually. So the ignition switch, the fuel pump switch, and the start button all came out of that panel. And these ones are just other ordinary aftermarket toggle switches. These three are closest to the driver because these are the three you need to get to if it all goes horribly wrong. So what we've done is the ignition switch is up for on and the fuel pump is up for on. So if it all goes a bit peak tongue, all you've got to do is do that and everything shuts down. And then the battery kill switch is just over here so you can switch everything down while you're still strapped in. So that's what the gauges were all about. It's as much about budget and function as it is about look.